We're now going to um, turn our attention away from molecules in themselves as individual molecules. Now focus on molecules together and within a substance and how they interact with each other. So last year you uh, were introduced to four types of solids. One was covert network, ionic, metallic. Um, these um, have different types of particles, different types of bonds that hold them together. Now, this needs to kind of still be there in, in the background of your mind. We're not going to go into any more detail, but sometimes they do compare um, what we're going to focus on, molecular substances, with an example of these. And because we're going to spend all our time focusing on molecular substances and explaining them, Sometimes if you get thrown an ionic substance, you're going to call it a molecular when it's not. So just bear that in mind. And that's where perhaps the uh, most valuable stuff is this in here. Oops. Uh, is that when you're looking at the different um, things being studied or data being given to you, the metals and not, if you're a metal or non-metal, it has to be ionic. If it's just metals, it's metallic. Um, the only one that could get confused with is this covalent network because they are also non-metals but they'll be much much higher uh, in strong yeah higher melting points because it's much stronger the bond so but just bear this in mind so just kind of lock this away there um i haven't written this down but yeah covalent network held together by covalent bonds bionic bionic bonds and metallic bimetallic bonds so they kind of come from their names but what we're going to spend all our time on is thinking at the forces between molecules, which last year we just described as weak intermolecular forces. And now we're going to learn that there are three types of these forces um, at play. So they fit within the, the realm of um, electrostatic uh, forces of attraction because they are occurring between these positively and negatively charged species. What's really important and, and relevant to this as well is that the stronger the attraction, the more energy is required to break them. And we're going to see evidence for that in melting points and boiling points. So if you get data about those and you see a, a high, an increase in melting point, for example, you know there's an increase in uh, attraction for some reason. And then you need to explain why. And if you've got, for example, yeah, an uneven distribution of electrons, say so like a polar molecule we often think about, you're going to have a dipole. And that creates some charges that are able to attract each other. And when you've got the oppositely charged um, charges next to each other, you get those attractions as intermolecular forces or a force of attraction. So as mentioned, we, got, we just called them intermolecular forces, but there are three types. There's temporary dipole-dipole attractions, also known as inst instantaneous dipole-dipole attractions. Permanent dipole-dipole attractions and hydrogen bonds. I'm going to explain these now. So first of all, temporary dipole, dipole attractions. And these form in all types of molecules. All of them. Nonpolar and polar ones alike. In nonpolar molecules, this is the only force that occurs. And this has to be, there has to be some attraction forces within nonpolar things because otherwise they wouldn't form liquids or solids. So they're there, um, and, and the type that exists are called temporary dipole. And from the name, you can get the clue that they're not ones that always exist. It's just there for a, a short period of time. That's where instantaneous comes from as well. That they're not permanent stick around things, but just uh, occur in an instant, um, and, but can result in creating some um, attraction forces. So around every um, atom and therefore every molecule, there's electrons, and they can be arranged um, in different ways, and and you can arrange them in ways where there's this even spread, and there's no dipole. But if you um, have an uneven spread of electrons, so you have more electrons on one side than the other, you can end up with this temporary dipole created. And then if a molecule with a temporary dipole is next to another molecule, it can induce a dipole in that molecule and therefore result in the um, creation of a attraction. So let's, I'll show you some pictures to illustrate this a bit more. So this is talking about instantaneous. So if we've got chlorine there, even distribution of electrons, no dipole. But if for some reason, some point in time, 
the chlorine on the right has more electrons, kind of shown by that sh the, the, the um, density of that green colour. It ends up with slightly negative charge, whereas the other chlorine has slightly positive charge. And that's just, it's just random, just chance. And if it's next to other molecules, you can induce dipole. So you can, this can also occur in single atoms. So this model on the left hand side, so we'll focus, oh, focusing on the left hand side, is focusing on um, like helium or something like this, individual atoms. They too can attract each other because if they have an uneven distribution of electrons like this, so there are more electrons out that side, so this part of the molecule is slightly, oh, sorry, the atom, whatever, is slightly positive. And if it's next to this molecule there, the slight positive charge is going to draw some electrons from here towards itself. And in doing so, it basically replicates its dipole in the next one, so inducing it. And then once it's done that, it's created this attraction force there. So that's your temporary dipole, dipole attraction right there between those two uh, temporary dipoles. And this occurs, is, of course, occurs throughout the whole um, substance, creating all these different little temporary dipoles, which are changing all the time, but they're there long enough to hold the molecule, or molecules, atoms close enough. So this is this on the left hand side was focusing on um, just atoms, but applying it to molecules, same diff here, uneven distribution, and going to induce the next door. And so this one here, if we've got a slightly negative charge, that could repel the electrons on this side, so they move to the right, creating a slight positive charge and an attraction force. And so that's how our temporary dipoles are made within a substance, just by chance and by inducing them in their neighbouring mole uh, molecules. So we can see some trends. So here are some molecules, fluorine, chlorine, bromine and iodine. These are non-polar because they're just uh, just atoms bound to themselves, same electron negativity. So that's that. So they've only got temporary. And what do we see? We see as you're going down, as you're going down, the melting point is going up. All right, this is a trend. As you go down, melting point goes up. It goes up. Okay, so that's that's what we see in the data. The only other information we're given here is also as you go down this way. Oh, I should go down no, that way. As you're going down that way, you've got an increase in the molar mass. And that's the hint, so it's increasing in size. So what's happening when relevant? What you're getting is you're getting more electrons. And if you've got more electrons, you can more easily create a bigger um, electron uh, cloud distortion. So you can have a bigger temporary dipole and therefore have a stronger attractions between them. So <coughs> imagine if you've only got say 10 electrons in this molecule there, those are the two atoms, you can perhaps get up to like one electron on this side, oops, one E minus there and then nine E minus is there, and that's as strong as you can get. Whereas if you've got a hundred, let's say, then you could potentially have, say, two electrons there and 98 electrons there and create a much bigger, to try to show that the shape, much bigger um, dipole by having many more electrons on that side. So the more electrons are there, there are the, the greater possibility of creating a stronger temporary dipole. So we see those increases in the properties. Another trend we can see in the um, te temporary dipoles, we can see how shape affects things. So if you've got um, things more like rods this down here, those shapes, you can get much closer um, and have greater contact between the molecules and that creates greater um, tractions. So straight chain, for example, um, alkene, alkanes have um, high melting points, boiling points than those with branches. And because the branches are more like spheres up here, and so they've got much less surface contact with each other and therefore weaker attract um, weaker attractions. So example, so this is all based on pent pentanes, there's the isomers there. So this one here is when you've got um it's got it's, they call it neopentane, but 
Oops, I need that CH there. Oops, I'm fixing that. All right, so this molecule here, which we'd call 2,2-dimethylpropane, is a systematic name. There and there is kind of like, you know, it's a tetrahedrally uh, arranged uh, molecule, and so it's kind of like, more like a sphere, like spheres there. Yeah. And they have limited contact with each other, so they have a... Um, boiling point that's lower than let's say this straight chain where they're all in a row so this is just what we normally call pentane and they're more like this rod structure and they've got more contact <coughs> and they have an increase there's a difference in boiling point it's not as great as you see in the number of electrons but it is a noticeable change in something in between say like when you've got this molecule here, we've got one branch coming off there. It's not as long, but not as um, spherical as the other one. That is in between the two. So shape can also affect temporary dipole strength. So those are temporary dipoles. All molecules have them. Permanent dipoles. Now, only pol polar molecules have these. And they're permanent because they've always got that dipole. So they've always got that uneven distribution due to differences in electronegativity. negativity. And if we think of sim simplicity, like HCl here, that one there, um, it has uh, on the left-hand side, there's a chlorine more electronegative, so it's got some more electrons on that side, down that side. And so they can um, have uh, those attraction force always there, so when they uh, get close to other molecules of HCl, they can form those permanent dipole-dipole attractions. So if we're going to compare molecules that are the same basic um, molar mass, the same size, the same number of electrons, about anyway, and we compare them, they will see that polar ones have a high melting point and boiling point. So fluorine, for example, to HCl, very similar in number of electrons, is taken from the molar mass. So molar mass, again, we just use a guide that gives a rough guide of electrons. And... Melting points there, it's almost twice uh, as high, or it's an extra you know, 100 degrees higher for HCl by having that permanent dipole. So, turn dipoles exist with polar molecules. And with polar molecules, is a subset of um, molecules that have what is called hydrogen bonding. This is the strongest intermolecular force for its size and up to about 10 percent of a covalent bond and what where these exist is exists um, when you have bonds between hydrogens and oxygens hydrogens and fluorines and hydrogens and nitrogens and it's because they've got really high differences in electronegativity and they're also small because uh, if it was just to do with electronegativity hcl would be should be a candidate because it has the same difference between the H and the CL as there between the H and the N. But the nitrogen is so much smaller, so the molecules can get closer, atoms get closer to each other, and therefore has that presence of hydrogen bonding. So it's still the size and also differences in electronegativity. And so if the molecules have these, at, um, these, these bonds, bonds between hydrogens and fluorines, hydrogens and oxygens, hydrogens and nitrogens, they can attract the, um, you know, these other pairs in neighbouring molecules. HF, uh, so fluorine, though it's, it does have that um, hydrogen bonding, it's only within the molecule of HF because fluorine only forms one bond, whereas oxygen forms two and nitrogen forms three. So we can, we're going to see hydrogen bonding between uh, with OH groups and NH groups come up much more prevalent, much more common than you are HF because there's only one example of HF, even though it's the strongest. So water, for example, and that's water has a relatively high it's only, um, melting point, boiling point, you know, zero degrees for melting, 100 degrees for boiling, um, even though it's very small. There's very few electrons. So it doesn't have uh, very strong temporary dipoles, it is polar, but it's these hydrogen bondings that, between all the different molecules that really hold it together. And we've also seen hydrogen bonding before certain, uh, in things like DNA. So the base pairs 
hold together through hydrogen bonding between the different groups. So A goes with T because there's two hydrogen bonds pair up. And C goes always with G because there's, a, there's um, room for three hydrogen bonds to exist. And so hydrogen bonding was really, really important in biological molecules. Um, the reactivity in enzymes is, is hugely um, controlled or affected by hydrogen bonding within that active site. So if we think of all the different types of molecules, we've got ones that have temporary dipole dipole attractions and non-polar molecules only have these. But all molecules have temporary. In a subset of those are polar molecules. So polar molecules have temporary dipole dipole attractions and permanent dipole dipole attractions. But a subset of those polar molecules have hydrogen bonding. And these are molecules with nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine, not bound to hydrogen. So if a molecule is hydrogen bonding, it has permanent and temporary dipole as well, dipoles as well. If it is polar, it has permanent and di uh, temporary dipole dipole attractions. But if it is non-polar, that is all they have, temporary dipole dipole attractions. So just in summary here, um, the strength of the bonds, so we're thinking of strength, we've got to think about how, how many electrons there are. There, we've got the more electrons, the stronger the intermolecular attractions are, and this is increasing temporary. The shape, more rod-like, less sphere-like, rod is stronger. Polarity, if you've got some pol polar versus non-polar, polarity increases because you've got a new type of um, intermolecular attraction forces. And then hydrogen bonding also increases that. So here's a little table here, HFC, HCl, HBr, HI. So you might be given this sort of data and you need to explain the attractions in here. So we're going to look at the thing, the trends, what do we, got, what do we see? So we see that from this point here, we've got uh, an increasing boiling point as you go down there. These are all polar molecules, simple polar molecules. And this one here has an H to an F. All right, so it's going to come, it's a hydrogen bound to fluorine. So that's going to be important. So, what are we, how can we explain this, these trends? The first thing is they're all polar, therefore they're all going to have permanent dipole dipole attractions and temporary dipole dipole attractions. But to explain this trend here, we want to be focusing on the temporary dipole dipole attractions. Because as you go from HCl to HI, you're increasing in size because you those uh, halogens are going down the periodic table and they're getting more and more electrons in, uh, as they go. So you're going to have a larger molar mass from HCl to HI, therefore increasing the number of electrons present. And with more electrons, uh, the molecule is more polarizable which means creates a bigger dipole and therefore has a stronger temporary dipole dipole attractions and that is why those boiling points are increasing as you go down but HF doesn't fit that if that if this is if if um, HF just fit this pattern then HF you'd imagine would be minus 100 degrees but it's much much higher it's, it's 120 degrees higher than what you would expect and that is because of hydrogen bonding it's also alongside that permanent dipole attractions and temporary dipole dipole attractions, it's got hydrogen bondings. And, and hydrogen bonds are strong, very strong, and therefore you need more energy to break these. And that's why it's the hydrogen, um, highest boiling point of these ones.